Terima kasih Bapak Lim, Bapak Pendeta. Uh, I say thank you so much for Pastor Lim here. And thank you for coming to uh, the fellowship tonight, worshiping Jesus together. Do you know, ladies and gentlemen, that there are billions of people, billions of the be, who never sense and know the presence of God, like you and I here this afternoon. You know, we're sitting here, standing here, worshiping God, and enjoying His presence. And that is great. We are blessed, and we thank God for His presence. But there are billions who doesn't know that God has given them His only begotten Son, and they too can receive eternal life. They too can experience the joy and the peace, the love, the forgiveness that you and I have. And so, I would like to encourage you today to Think in a way that I believe will change your destiny and impact nations in a way that we never have imagined possible. There's a story in the book of Luke chapter 16. Chapter 15, I'm sorry. Whenever the Wycliffe Bible translators, they sent a missionary to go to a foreign land where the Bible have never been translated into that language, either because they are a tribe way in the middle of Papua New Guinea or Indonesian Papua or somewhere in the middle of the continent of Asia or over there in Africa. The missionaries or the Bible translators usually take a lot of time living among the people before they're able to learn the language and eventually write it down and begin to put it together in a form that can be understood by the people from the outside. And whenever they are able to form the first sentence or two, the first Bible verse that they always translate it is John chapter 3, verse 16. And of course, as Christians, you and I know why. Because that is the Bible in one short verse. For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, so that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. And then they continue to learn more words until they can finally form a story or tell a story in that particular tribal or local language. And for some reason, the story that they always write down first, or the story that they first tell um, or put into writing, will be the story that I'm about to read for you uh, right now. It is the parable or the story of the prodigal son. Luke chapter 15, Jesus told the story about a father that had two sons. The younger one went away until finally not only he used up the money that the father gave him in ways that probably is not uh, good for him or definitely is not necessarily the best way to spend one's money. Then a great famine happened in the land. You know, sometimes in life, ladies and gentlemen, there are situations that happen beyond our capability to control. And so it doesn't matter where you are or what situation you find yourself under, all of a sudden, the situation around you overwhelms you and change and literally put you in a very difficult situation. And that is what happened to this young man in Luke chapter 15. But then he made one wise decision. All of us in life probably have made some wrong decisions. I did, you probably did, here and there, sometime in the past. Decisions that we regret. But it is good to make one right decision. And this young man made a decision to go back to the Father. He has been away from the presence of the Father. But he made the decision, the right decision to come back home. I made that right decision 48 years ago when I was 19 years old. I told the folks that were here yesterday in the meeting that was sponsored by City Mission. I want to thank Pastor Darren and the rest of the elders that gave me the opportunity to be here, Pastor Lim here uh, this afternoon, but also for the meeting yesterday with uh, City Mission Church and also co-sponsored by our friends from Marketplace Leadership Institute. 
Uh, we have uh, people here yesterday that I was sharing in here. And I was telling them uh, a little of my testimony uh, where I came from in the island of Timor. And Pastor Lim said to you here, you know, the country of Indonesia is just south here of Singapore. You all know where it is. An hour flight from uh, Changi will bring you to Jakarta. And if you fly another three hours or so from Jakarta to the southeast, you are going to end up in the island of Timor that I came from. If you happen to fly from Darwin, or an hour and change north of Darwin, you will arrive in the city of Kupang that uh, Pastor Lee mentioned, and that is the capital city of the island of Timor. Timor is one of the islands that make up the country of Indonesia. They told us that we have 17,578 islands, uh, 587 islands that make up the country of Indonesia. We have about 250 million people as of today, and Missiologists will tell us that it's the biggest Muslim country in the world and we would like them to think that way that is okay except I want to tell you that God has been at work in that country of mine and in the islands and things are changing many are embracing the love of the Father and come and worship Jesus and know his presence like you and I are here today so the young man made one right decision I made the decision when I was 19 years old and this is how it happened I grew up in the Dutch Reform, or, we, or I will sometimes call it the Presbyterian Church in the island. The reason being was that 400 years ago, the Dutch sailors sailed from Rotterdam and Amsterdam down the western coast of uh, West Africa, turned around down by the Cape of Good Hope, and from there they sailed almost straight east and slightly to the north. And that is how they arrived uh, in the country or in the islands of Indonesia at that time. They call it the Spice Islands and they came for the spices that was a uh, very needed and important commodity in world commerce at that time. And just like the Singaporeans, we Indonesians are very hospitable people and so we told the Dutch sailors that came our way, Mikasa, Sukasa, Rumah Saya, Rumanda, my house, your house, welcome. Well. Coming to think of it, we probably shouldn't have been that generous because the Dutch traders who came to my part of the world decide to overcome or overstay our hospitality by about 350 years. <laughs> so that was a long guest in anybody's house, so to speak, just like what the British have done here in Malaysia and Singapore in those days since Sir Stamford Raffles. Uh, decide to visit uh, this corner of the globe where your beautiful country now located and the rest is history. After the Second World War we uh, proclaimed our independence and besides the Dutch traders that came for trading at that time and the way we look at it in those days took away a lot of the wealth of the nations and bring it back into their own countries it was a uh, dark chapter in our history but also by the grace of God he turned what meant uh, what men uh, uh, planned for evil or meant for evil into something great because besides the traders the missionaries came to my part of the world and praise God they bring the gospel to us and of course one of the stories that they told us is the story of the father with the two sons and the story of the young son that walk back or decide to come back to the house of the father one of the things in this story that i like very much if you can read it there it said here that uh when he was walking toward the father's house this is what it said and he arose and came to his father verse 20 but while he was still a long way off his father saw him felt compassion ran and embraced him the young man hungry and tired probably were walking slowly to the father's house and by the time he get to the farm or the estate of the father he probably could hardly walk because it has been a long journey he was dragging his feet coming toward the father but the response of the father was so wonderful 
The father just didn't walk over to the son. He ran to the son. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to tell you something. The father will run you to the next day. You don't have to run his way. All you need to do is walk and crawl his direction. Because maybe because of the situation in life, you don't feel and don't have the strength to run his way. You can just crawl his direction. You can take it a step at a time. And I promise you, to the, this afternoon, he will run your way. He will embrace you. And not only he will run and embrace you, but he will say to the servants, bring in the rope, bring in the, the ring, bring in the sandals, and now kill the fatted calf, and let us have music and dancing, and let us celebrate. I'm here to tell you to this afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, that I believe the church is in a period, in a time right now, where God is calling His people and is calling the church to begin to celebrate. Because God is doing something in this world that is worth celebrating. In my case, 48 years ago, I was sick with malaria during my high school years. I took medication, I prayed, and nothing happened. Finally, one day, I decided to find out why the malaria is still with me after all my high school years. Kneeling down on the dirt floor in the little hut that I have. As you know, we came from the little islands. Uh, we still believe in living green, where everything is biodegradable. So we built our houses with a grass roof and a bamboo wall and a dirt floor. No electricity, no, ban uh, no running water. I always jokingly told my friends all over the world, whenever I give my testimony, we have no running water, but we run to the water and we got our running water. So, kneeling down in the dirt floor, I said to God, God, what is the matter with the church that I belong to? You know, it's always nice to blame somebody for your problem, you know. So, the church is a convenient uh, uh, one to blame. So, I said to God, what is, what's the matter with this church? I've been praying for years for my malaria to be healed, but still I'm sick. And I was waiting for God to tell me. I waited for a long time. Heaven was quiet, it seems to me. So I finally changed my question and said, Lord, is there anything wrong with me? Probably after going to church these last 19 years. You said in the Bible, ask and you shall receive. Well, I've been asking. I haven't received. What was missing? Is there anything wrong with me? Probably. I say probably, Doc, because I figure I've gone to church for 19 years. And you know, sang in Sunday school, I mean, uh, teaching Sunday school, learning Sunday school, sang in the choir, so everything should be okay. But to my surprise, ladies and gentlemen, I heard an audible voice, and the voice said, yes. Surprise as to the answer, I turned around and said, get the behind me, devil. I didn't want the devil to interrupt my conversation with God, but then I realized it hasn't, it must not be God, the devil because I was talking to God. So I said, God, what was wrong with me in your opinion? And the voice said to me, Mel, you have gone to church for 19 years and that is good. I was happy that God recognized, you know, that in a, when the city mission church, every Sunday afternoon at 3 o'clock open, I'm there and you are here. God recognized that. I was pleased that, you know, he knows what was going on. Well, for 19 years I've gone to church since I was young. God recognized it and he thought that was good. But what he said later on was a little disconcerting to me because the voice said, But you are not my child yet. You are not a Christian. Now that doesn't seem right to me because my parents have brought me to church. My grandparents on both sides have come to church since the Dutch missionaries came to my island some years before. How dare God spoke the way he did by telling me that I'm not a Christian. I got off my knees, walked out the door and slammed the door behind me thinking this is the first time God speak to me and he managed to hurt my feelings already. So I got out the door, stayed with my friends for a couple of days, saying to myself, I hope God apologized for the way he was talking. He didn't. I came back a few days later because I want some clarification why God said what He did. Kneeling down on the same dirt floor, I said, God, sorry for walking out on you the other day. Uh, if you forgive me, I'll forgive you for the way you talked to me and hurt my feelings. Let us call it even and continue the conversation. So I said, God, why did you say that I am not a Christian and I'm not a child of God? Isn't going to church every Sunday qualify me or anybody for that matter to become a Christian? 
And I figured this time God will certainly apologize after the good reason that I just presented to him. But ladies and gentlemen, to my surprise, the voice came back and this is what the voice said. Mel, if going to the barn once a week <coughs> qualify you to become a cow, then going to the church once a week like you did will qualify you to become a Christian. Well, I remember thinking to myself, you know, I hate the way God talks. But he has a good point. You can go to the barn once a week to visit or you may decide to sleep in the barn. Well, the worst that can happen, ladies and gentlemen, is that you smell like a cow or got dirtier than a cow, but you never become a cow for sleeping or visiting the barn once a week. So I wonder how one become a cow. Oh, of course, it is easy to understand. My father raised a couple of them cows in the village that we grew up. You can only become a cow by being born unto the cow family. And so God was right. Going to the barn doesn't turn you to become a cow. But the worst part that I didn't like was going to the church every Sunday doesn't make you to become a Christian. There has to be a better way than that. And I wonder how. how? Oh, of course, I understand with the illustration that God gave me. You have to be born into a cow family to become a cow. Well, God is a spirit. According to Jesus in his conversation in John chapter 3 with Nicodemus, Nicodemus, you must be born again. And Apostle John wrote it very simply, as many as receive him, Jesus. Jesus, the only gift that the Father gave to us, that they will receive eternal life, their sins will be forgiven, and they will become the child of the living God. Well, on that day, on my knees in the dirt floor, I accepted Jesus as my Savior. And ladies and gentlemen, what a wonderful feeling. I know those of you who have accepted Jesus, you know what I'm talking about. If you haven't yet, well, join the club, my friend. That's, that is why you're here tonight. Take that step and you too will know what I'm telling you right now. I feel like a whole tons of brick has gone off a roll of my soldier. And for the first time in my life, I know that I know that I know that my sins are forgiven. God is my father. Heaven will be my home. And I am the child of the living God. It was such a joyous occasion. You know, I was kneeling down there to ask God why he didn't answer my prayer and heal me with the malaria from the malaria that I've suffered during my high school years. But after I accepted the Lord and I received the peace and the assurance that I was his child, I was so happy I forgot to ask him about, you know, the healing, about the malaria. I got off the door, met my friends and tell my first friend that I met, Johnny, I said, Johnny, kneel down, please. You need to confess your sins. Poor Johnny did it. You know, we are friends, you know, so we can kind of do that to your friends. Don't do it to a total stranger because they might not appreciate that. So Johnny knelt down and I said, confess your sins. He said, which one? I said, well, the ones you can remember. The one you forgot, I will remind you as long as you start now. Johnny did. And he said, Johnny, it is important that you accept Jesus as your Savior because He is the Father's gift to you and I and to all of us. Johnny did. He was born again. I said, Johnny, let us tell all our friends about Jesus. And that is how 48 years ago, ladies and gentlemen, I made the decision to come to the Father's house like the young man in the story of Luke chapter 15. It totally changed my life. Because with my friend Johnny, we went all over and tell our friends about Jesus. Like I said, I forgot to ask him to heal me from my malaria, but I'll come back to that in a minute. The following two weeks, anybody of my friends that we met, we led them to the Lord. Two weeks later, I asked the pastor to give us the key to the church Sunday night so that we can have a little Bible study and prayer meeting. We did good the first Sunday. The second Sunday, as we were about to close the service that night, something happened that we didn't quite expect. The Holy Spirit came down just like he did in the book of Acts chapter 2. You remember in the book of Acts chapter 2, verse 1 to verse 4, the Bible said, They were there together and one heart and one accord. All of a sudden, a sound like a mighty wind came down the church and tongues of fire came down upon the disciples. They were filled with the Holy Ghost, speak in tongues in other languages. And Peter stood up and preached and 3,000 people came to the Lord. You remember that story? Oh, somebody's putting it up there. Thank you so much. On the day of Pentecost. That night, 48 years ago, on the 26th of September, 1965, it happened just like it was in the day of Pentecost. 
We heard the sound of the mighty wind. We saw the fire that was there. The man in the police station across the street rang the fire alarm because he saw that the top of the church building was on fire. So he wanted the people to come and quench the fire. But when the people came from all over the village, there was no fire. It was not the natural fire. It was the visitation of the Spirit of the living God. Fulfilling the promise that God gave to the prophet Joel long time ago. Where the Bible said, in the last days, I shall pour down my spirit upon all, uh, upon all flesh. You know, your sons and daughters will prophesy. You know, they shall, uh, that is there, you can see it. Uh, they were filled with the Holy Ghost and speak with other, other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. It happened in my church just like that. All of my friends, my young friends that were there in the church, we were just about from 17 to 20 plus years old. All of us from the Dutch Reform, the Presbyterian Church, like the Anglican Church here in, uh, uh, in Singapore. And we were raising up the hand and praising God. I was a little surprised as to what they're doing because that's something unusual. You are supposed to do that when you, know, you come to church. We've never done it like that before. But when the Holy Ghost came, He has full control. He lead us to do whatever that He wants us to do. My friends were lifting up their hands. And as I was a little disturbed by their behavior, which is quite unusual for us, I heard the lady that is next to me standing to my sister, who has never gone to school. She never spoke Indonesian, which is our national language, only Timorese, which is the tribal language. She has never known that English exists. But that night, under the unction of the Holy Spirit, this young lady lift up her hand and worship God in perfect English. And I remember as I looked to her and listened to what she was saying, I said, this has to be a miracle. And not only she was praising God in perfect English, others were praising the Lord in different language. But one thing that the Lord did that night, ladies and gentlemen, as people were worshiping God and those who came from the outside, they were surprised as to the sound of the uh, praising and some people were crying, some people were kneeling, and some people were lifting up their hand, praising God. And those who came from the uh, outside were literally their heart captured and convicted under the Holy Ghost. Some of them were in their knees crying, confessing their sins. Some of them accepted the Lord for the first time. Some of them joined and praised God and were filled with the Holy Ghost. It was quite a wonderful happenings or experience that took place in my church that night. And as we were continuing to praise God, a friend of mine stood up in the front and said, Ladies and gentlemen, this is the visitation of the Spirit. And the reason God gave us of His Spirit, because in the book of Acts, chapter 1, verse 8, Jesus said to the disciples, You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses from here until the uttermost part of the world. Of course, it said to Jerusalem, Judea, and until the uttermost part of the world. And the Holy Spirit said to us that night, You must go unto Jerusalem, your surrounding areas, Samaria, your island, let us say it that way, Judea or Judea, Samaria, the other islands, into the other part, uh, the other most part of the world. God said to us that day, the Holy Spirit that is given to you is to empower you. So you do not keep this good news of salvation, joy, peace, and forgiveness, and eternal life that you have received in the person of Jesus to yourself. But you have to allow others who doesn't know him to come to know him as well. And so we did. The next day, the first team, my sister joined that team because God called her into that team. They went to the next village to preach the gospel. The following day, another team went out. In the first three months, we have 70 teams going from village to village to preach the gospel. And in those days, on the first three months of the Great Revival, about 80,000 people were born again and joined the church. And that was the beginning of a great work that God has done in my country. Praise Jesus. The amazing part about it that surprised all of us is that wherever we go and preach the gospel and share Jesus with others, not only people who are born again, but as a bonus, we found out that the God of the Bible is still the same. Well, we have known about it, memorizing Hebrew 13, 8, Jesus Christ is the same, yesterday, today, and forever. Of course, we know the promise of Jesus in John chapter 14, 12. We never see it happen, but we know it. We believe it. Verily. Verily I say unto you, those who believe on me, the works that I have done, they shall do it also. Even greater works than this, they shall do. Well, we know it, we believe it, we memorize it, we just have never seen it happen. But as we went out, 
going from village to village to preach the gospel, going to other islands to share Jesus, we discover, like what the Bible said in Mark chapter 16, when the disciples went forth and preached the gospel, God confirmed the word that with signs following. It is my pleasure to testify to you tonight, ladies and gentlemen, that in this last 48 years, as one of the teams went from village to village to preach the gospel, God has confirmed the word of God that they preached to the people with signs and wonders that were following. We have seen the blind see, the creeper walk, the deaf hear, people healed from all kinds of diseases. As a matter of fact, we have seen people that were raised from the dead. I remember when our team arrived to that place, the man has been dead for two days. The team were invited to come to the funeral service because usually that is where you got the best crowd. You know, in those days, you know, people don't go to church, but they will go to the funeral service for some reason, maybe to pay their last respect to the one that just departed. And so usually you have a good crowd in the funeral service. And the team were invited to go there in order to preach a little gospel message when the time comes. And God has a better idea. He told the team to stand around the dead person and sing a couple of songs, which was a quite a smart idea in my humble opinion, because when you open your mouth and start praising God, and you have 10,000 green flies flying everywhere, some of them might mistake your mouth or your tongue as a, a runway and decide to land there, and you end up swallowing one or two, and I don't think that is a smart idea. But obeying God, we begin to sing, and as we come to the seventh song, all of a sudden, the man was surprised, and we were surprised because the dead man woke up, or if you want to say, raised from his deep, dead sleep, and make the announcement, I'm alive! I was dead before! We said, yeah, we know you were dead. You smell, you know, uh, a mile away. But he said, Jesus, send me back to tell you people that there's life after this life. You know, some experts said, when you die, it is all over. Well, but those experts who said that has never been dead before. So how do they know that when you die, it is all over? Well, let me tell you about this gentleman here. He has been dead for two days. He came back and said, there is life after this life. I will go by his testimony and his experience than the argument of an expert who have never been dead and try to convince us about something that he has told nothing about. So this gentleman who has been dead for two days said, I was there. I know that heaven and hell is real. But Jesus sent me back to let you folks know that there's the only that the only way to go to heaven is when in this life you accepted Jesus as your own personal Savior. Hallelujah. Well, he finished his short testimony. We took on what he said and simply expound from the Bible and tell the people and said, ladies and gentlemen, what this gentleman just said is exactly what the Bible said. All of us, you and I, we all need to accept Jesus because he's God's gift. For all of us. And when we receive it, we will receive eternal life. Well, you don't have to convince the people any more than that. They saw that this year, this gentleman that has been dead for two days, for whose funeral they were attending that day, now is alive, smiling, praising the Lord. In that region alone, over 20 plus thousand people accepted the Lord because of that one miracle and the preaching of the Word of God in that, in that place. God has done many wonderful things in my island since then, you know, we travel from island to island, from place to place, preaching the gospel, and we thank God for what He's doing. But tonight, I'm here, ladies and gentlemen, with a very simple message for you. And that is what the Father said to the servant, and said to the son, and the sons, and said to the people in His house. It is appropriate to celebrate. It is time to celebrate. Why? Because the lost has come back home, and the one that were dead now is alive. I believe, ladies and gentlemen, we are living in a very exciting generation. If uh, the ladies back there can throw up a picture up to the front, if you don't mind to take a look at it, I will explain it here in a minute. But about a month ago, I was in Los Angeles. Uh, just a little update to what's happening since I accepted the Lord 48 years ago. Since then, ladies and gentlemen, I've been traveling all over the world. I live in California these last 30 some years, and I travel all over the world preaching the gospel, the gospel sins. I've been here in Singapore uh, in years past, in 1970, when Bishop Chu from uh, the 
uh, from the Anglican Church here was a bishop. He's now retired, I believe, in uh, England. Uh, I came here with a full gospel businessman and other friends in this great city of yours. And it is a pleasure and a privilege to come back here again today. If you look at that picture there, about a month ago, I was in Los Angeles and a young man from South Africa said to me, Mel, what do you think of this generation? You know, the question came out of the blue. I wasn't, you know, preparing uh, to be thinking about it. He just gave me the question. I remember thinking to myself, what shall I tell this young man? You know, I wasn't sure why he asked the question either. And then all of a sudden, as I was trying to come up with a, a decent answer, I found myself speaking to the young man and I said to him, this is the grand finale generation. And as I was saying that to this young man, I remember thinking to myself, what in the world are you talking about? Well, later on, somebody sent me this picture and I would like to explain to you, ladies and gentlemen, what I believe the Holy Spirit is preparing and is going to do in Singapore, in the churches, in our life, in days to come. That picture that you see there was the grand finale of a firework that took place in Dubai in 2008. That is when they uh, celebrated the opening of the Atlantis Hotel, if I am not mistaken, and they throw up that big firework right there. That is a million dollar firework, they said. It is the biggest uh, firework on earth so far, until maybe one of these days somebody throw in a little bit more money and got something bigger. And it uh, gained its place in the Guinness Book of World Record. And it's supposed to, it is said that it was seen from outer space because of the magnitude of the, the greatest firework ever displayed or ever, uh, ever take place. You can take it down, that's okay. And so, um, this is the grand finale. And as you notice, oh sorry, don't take it down yet. As you notice why this is a great grand finale, usually in normal fireworks when we celebrate 4th of July or the independence of Singapore or whatever grand occasion if you go to Disneyland or Disney World, the grand finale usually is great. You only see all those big explosions in the skies. Those are usually what happen. But the reason this one is so great is not only the explosions on the top, but the ones in the middle, but especially what I like the most that make it wonderful is the lights in the floor. The millions of the little light in the floor or in the uh, lower area enhance the position and the great explosion that happened in the skies. This, I believe, the kind of grand finale that God has in mind when I was speaking to that young man in uh, California a month ago by telling him that this is a grand finale generation. You know why, ladies and gentlemen? Because this is what Jesus said. Upon this rock I build my church. The very gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And we will go from glory to glory. And our path will shine brighter and brighter until the dawning of the new day. When he, Jesus Christ, the bright and morning star, shall appear in the sky, and all of his children, you and I, and those that we have left to the Lord, will enter into that glorious place that we call home, where the Father resides, so that forever and forever we praise his holy name. It is from glory to glory we will go, ladies and gentlemen. I was reading uh, this afternoon as we are praising the Lord from the book Isaiah chapter 60. It said, Arise! For the glory of the Lord has signed upon you. Darkness and great darkness are covering this earth. But rise, because God will release His glory and His brightness upon His people. You know, we live in a world uh, facing a lot of challenges. Uh, we have seen the uh, clip from our sister that is in the uh, um, Philippines. Uh, she didn't quite show us all the uh, devastation that took place, but you probably have seen it in television and there's no need to running it through the heartache of what the people are going through. But that is just a small picture of the problems that are happening all over the world and it will be ever increasing. But ladies and gentlemen, God is saying, like he said to the people in the story of the prodigal son, it is appropriate, it is time to celebrate. Because in the midst of darkness, God's power will shine. And in 
in the world that we are living in today, ladies and gentlemen, the Holy Ghost is rising up a people and rising up an army here that will go to the world with the message of the gospel and bring literally millions of them, of them into the kingdom. I believe, ladies and gentlemen, when God started a firework long time ago, the big firework, maybe the first one, if you want to look at it that way as far as the history of the church, happened in the book of Acts chapter 2. The first firework took place and the church was born. And then later on, there are many fireworks and great events that took place. You may remember the time when Martin Luther, 500 plus years ago, you know, pounded those 95 declarations in the door of the castle of the church in Wittenberg. And that was the beginning of the Great Reformation. Later on, John Wesley and others, on their time, brought the revival and the power of God into the church and revived the church and impact nations in many great ways. Missionaries came to Indonesia. Missionaries came here to Singapore. Your forefathers came to God. The great revivals in the Americas. You know, the Dr. Billy Grahams and the Oral Roberts and the charismatic revival. The Jesus movement. And of course, I remember the great revival that took place 48 years ago in my little island of Timor. Those you can call the big fireworks that exploded in the sky. Bring forth the glory of God and light up the path of millions to Jesus in the nations and in the islands, in every tongue and tribe. Glory be to God. But ladies and gentlemen, I am here this afternoon to tell you something. That all the great things that has happened in the church from the day of Pentecost up to the yesterday, all those are great. I appreciate what God is doing. But the best, ladies and gentlemen, is in serve for this generation. On my way to Singapore, I was in uh, Mozambique where my dear friends Roland and Heidi Baker from Irish Ministries I have been serving God in Mozambique for these last 20 years. I was the best man 30 some years ago when Roland and Heidi were married. I met with Roland because uh, his interest on the Indonesian revival, he wrote me a long letter. So when I got to California some 40 years ago, he and I met and being that his grandfather was involved in a great movement of God in Kunming, China some 60 plus years ago where the Holy Spirit visited the orphan boys and girls and gave them vision of heaven and all that. His father also was born in China and missionary there all of his life and including Roland. He was born in China as well, speak Mandarin probably better than most people, especially for a white person, a foreigner. So we were friends until he met with Heidi. And then they were married 30 some years ago. I was the best man in the wedding. Sent them off for the honeymoon. And after the honeymoon, I sent them off to Indonesia for the first mission uh, trip. They were a year in Indonesia. From there they came to China, Philippines and other places. And then from there to um, England for five years or so. And about 20 years ago, the Lord told them to go to the poorest African country in Africa. When Heidi told me that, I said, uh oh, this is going to be trouble because these two here always obey God. And when they go to the poorest Muslim, uh, country in Africa, that is not going to be easy. Because ladies and gentlemen, I've been in Africa many, many times and I know the situation. You know, when you talk about Africa, all people think it's poverty. When you go to the poorest of the African nations, then that is really something else. So, I was thinking and praying for them as to what is going to happen. They went to Mozambique, the poorest of the African countries at that time. But ladies and gentlemen, when you go there, because the Lord sent you that way, ladies and gentlemen, when the continent on the island is the darkest, when their problems are the biggest, when their need are the greatest, that is when you can expect God to show up big time, ladies and gentlemen. And I don't need to elaborate to you today, but let me tell you that in these last 20 years, they have seen the demonstration of the power of God, because God is always delighted to show forth how great He is. When one uh, young man, his son came home, he got a big party, and he told everybody to celebrate. There has been a celebration going on in Mozambique these last 20 years, the Irish ministries today are taking care of about 10,000 plus churches in 10 plus African countries. They have about 30,000 children that they take care daily on a daily basis in 30 countries. They went to the northern part of Mozambique about five, six, seven years ago where the Makua tribe 
considered by a missiologist are the most difficult tribe to reach for the gospel. That is what they said. But my friends Roland and Heidi and the team went there. Every week they went out to what we call the bush bush. Means way, way out into nowhere. Just like you, you are in the island of Timor with the mud huts and all that. Well, there's no five-star hotels like you have in Orchard Street. If you go to the bus bus in Mozambique, you have to live under a million-star hotel. Which means that you have to pitch your tent in under the tree or in the open area somewhere. And the stars that you see, millions of them, up in the sky, that was the rating that you have or the tent that you sleep under. It is rather primitive, but the presence of God is always there. And in these last five, six, seven years in the northern part of Mozambique, they have seen people by 58 on the last count, I think, but more than that now that were raised from the dead. The blind see, the people walk, the deaf hear. I remember a year or two back, I was in Mozambique. We went to the bus bus and Heidi wanted to preach and then she was preaching and somebody else was preaching. And after we preached, you know, Heidi stood up because she spoke Portuguese fluently and the local Makuan language. So she said to the people, she said, anybody here who was stone deaf, please come forward, please, and we will pray for you and Jesus will heal you. So we were all looking around expecting. Nobody came forward, so Heidi repeated again. Anybody here who was stone deaf, please come forward. Well, we wait for 30 seconds a minute and nobody came forward. All of a sudden I realized, well, why nobody came forward? So I leaned over and said, Heidi, that is not the way to make the announcement. If you said anybody who was stone deaf can come forward, well, nobody is going to come forward because the person who is stone deaf is not going to hear your invitation. So, of course, they wouldn't come forward. So I can change it and say something like, if anybody here who knows of anybody who is stone deaf, please bring them forward. So she changed the announcement, you might say. Oh, a minute or two later, we saw the people in the village pushing a young man, a young lady or a young teenager, probably about 10 years old or so, and an older one, a mama with a baby behind her. So they were pushed to the front. They came, highly talked with them, and of course the people, the two people up front couldn't hear a word of what she was saying. So she said to the people, do you know these two here? Oh, yes, everybody said, we do. What happened with them? Everybody said, oh yeah, they're stone deaf. You know, they've lived in the village here for years. We know them. You know, they can hear. And Heidi said to them, if Jesus healed them tonight, will you, all of you, follow him? And I can hear the roar of the people in the village in the middle of the dark night. Everybody said, if he did, and if he does, we will follow him the rest of our lives. At that moment, I know, ladies and gentlemen, that the miracle is going to happen. Because God performed the miracles not to entertain the saints. Even though we saints would like to see the miracles so that we can write books about it and brag about it. Nothing wrong, I guess, to brag about Jesus. But God doesn't perform the miracles to entertain us. He performed the miracle to convert the sinner. And when I heard the fellow just said, they will follow Jesus. If Jesus does something that night, I knew that God is going to come through and heaven is going to deliver. We lay hands on the two. A second later, the ears were popped open. You can tell by the surprise in their eyes because their world has been very, very silent up to that minute. And now it has been a noisy world because the deaf ear has been opened and they were hearing for the first time. Oh, you can hear the cheering in the whole crowd there, ladies and gentlemen, as they realize that the two has heard, uh, their eyes have been opened, uh, their ears have been opened. They were repeating the words that Heidi was telling them. Well, needless to say, the next day, instead of 50 people in the little, the little church that over there by the side of the tree, they have to knock out the walls because a couple hundred people from the village have decided to follow Jesus and join in the church that day. Amen. All of this, ladies and gentlemen, was the reason that when Heidi and Roland went there seven years ago, there's not a church in the northern part of Mozambique in the state of Cabo Delgado because it was the Makua tribe, most of them are from other faiths. 
But today, I think Roland told me the other day, the numbers keep on increasing, so I'm not keeping up with it. But around 2,500 plus churches has been built in that particular region there, and the number is growing by the day. And ladies and gentlemen, I'm telling you, there's an explosion in the spirit. The fireworks, the canisters are blowing up into the skies, glorifying God and proclaiming to the world that Jesus is alive. God is doing that, ladies and gentlemen, all over the world. And that is great. That is a great firework. But ladies and gentlemen, I'm still proclaiming to you tonight. Can you put up that picture, please? This is the grand finale generation. Well, let us just imagine that what happened in Mozambique is the blue and over to the right hand corner. That's great. What happened during Martin Luther was the one in the left hand corner. And what happened in the day of Pentecost was the one on the top in the middle. Whatever you, however you want to imagine it. Oh, the revival in Timor in Indonesia, maybe we'll take the one in the middle, whatever explosion that happened up here, the one to the right. Let us call it what happened in the island of Timor 48 years ago. There's a great explosion in the spirit as the Holy Ghost has touched nations. But ladies and gentlemen, I'm here to let you know that the best is here. And I was telling the folks yesterday in the meeting that we have in this same in this very building, I'm convinced, ladies and gentlemen, that God has a destiny for Singapore that even I myself wasn't thinking about it before until yesterday. I mean, I love the Singaporeans. I know what God has done in this country, the great work of the Holy Spirit and the great churches and the fact that all of you are here, City Mission Church and all the different organizations and people and what you have done. I've known about all that and grateful for what you're doing. But let me tell you what God told me yesterday that surprised me in a good way. Because when I was here yesterday, I was sharing to the people and God gave me the word from the book of John where I was telling the folks here yesterday that there are three centers of influence that God was working with in the New Testament time. There are three people that were involved in the resurrection of Jesus. In John chapter 19 verse 38, it said that Pilate gave the permission for the body of Jesus to be taken down from the cross. And Joseph Arimathea was the one who asked for the body. And Nicodemus was there with 75 pounds of uh, spices that they put on the body of Jesus and put in the tomb that belonged to Joseph Arimathea. And three days later, he rose back from the dead. And those three individuals represent the three center of influence that exists in that generation, but also in this generation. The first one is Pilate. Pilate represents the government. And I told the folks here yesterday that a true government always gives permission or create a free environment in which the business and the church can function according to the will of God. Pilate represents the government. The second person is Joseph Arimathea. Joseph Arimathea represents the business community. He was the man with the money. He's the one who owned the caravans. He was the one who buy the tomb. And in that tomb, the body of Jesus was put. And the third person is Nicodemus. Nicodemus represented the church. So those three entities are center of influence. Pilate representing government. Joseph Arimathea representing the business and Nicodemus representing the church, working together, they brought Jesus from the cross to the tomb, and from the tomb he rose back from the dead, ladies and gentlemen, and the impact of that resurrection impacted you and I today, because today we can praise God because of the great salvation that you and I have received, because he came, was crucified, died, buried, and rose from the dead. And ladies and gentlemen, that is why you and I has been translated from the kingdom of darkness unto the kingdom of light because of He who came back to life, Jesus. Pilate, Joseph Arimathea, and Nicodemus was involved in what was happening. They are the three centers of influence in their generation. And that was great. But what was very surprising that made me very happy yesterday and sharing it with the people yesterday and I want to share it with you today it's very exciting because what happened with
Pilate and Joseph Arimathea and Nicodemus was then 2,000 years ago. Nothing wrong with it. It was great. It was important that it happened. But yesterday as we were here praising the Lord, the Lord made it very clear to me that Singapore has a major role that God has in the kingdom of God in these last days. Amen. And this is the way God explained it to me, my friend. Also, I explained to the people yesterday, they are the tale of three cities. When the Holy Ghost came down, He came in Jerusalem. Why Jerusalem? Because Jerusalem was the center of spiritual activity or influence in those days. And then from Jerusalem, the gospel goes everywhere. But until, not until Antioch came along, Antioch in those days were the center, the center of commerce in the old world, in the New Testament time. And it was the people in Antioch, the businessmen in Antioch, with the resources that God gave them, they were the ones who sent Paul and Barnabas and others unto the Asia Minor, up to Macedonia and the world at that time, and the gospel began to spread, continued to spread from Jerusalem to Europe and Asia at that time. It happened because of the involvement of the church in Antioch, the center of commerce at that time. But I also told the folks yesterday, the gospel was not complete in reaching the known world at that time until Paul came to Rome. Why Rome? Because Rome was the center of government at that time. So these three ancient cities represent the three centers of influence that was represented by Peter, Joseph, Arimathea, and Nicodemus. Jerusalem represented the church, Antioch represented the business world, and Rome represented government. And when those three cities are influenced by the gospel, working together, we see the plan of God accomplished in that generation. And ladies and gentlemen, for this generation, that is why it was exciting that I saw this yesterday. And to tell you the truth, I'm almost a little jealous that I'm not a Singaporean. But I get over it today already because I know Pastor Lim here, Brother Darren, Hawansi here, Peng He here, and all of you who are here. You all are Singaporeans, so I consider myself a Singaporean by your permission. May I consider myself a Singaporean because we are brothers and sisters in the Lord? Amen. Yes. All right. You are so kind to allow me to consider myself a Singaporean. But ladies and gentlemen, the Lord revealed and made it very clear to me yesterday. Now other countries have their place in the kingdom. There is no question about that. The Americans, the nations, the Australians and all the other countries. But Singapore, the Lord revealed to me yesterday that you are a nation that represents those three cities, those three entities in one place. Singapore, with your system of government and the freedom that you have here to follow Jesus and to pursue His plan and His purpose. Singapore is the center of commerce. We hate to, other people might not quite like it, but that is just the reality in the ground. You can't go anywhere in Asia without going through Singapore, at least in the old days, you know. Nowadays you can probably go straight from Tokyo to Jakarta or from Jakarta to somewhere else. But Singapore was the center or the hub of transportation for a long, long time and probably will continue to be in the future. But definitely, Singapore is the center of commercial activities or the banking and the financial ex uh, activities here reside in Singapore. I don't say this in offense, but you Singaporeans, you have zero natural resources. So you have to take and borrow the resources from the Indonesians and the Malaysians and all the surrounding countries and taking it from them, selling it to somebody else, taking the production from the Japanese and selling it to the Indonesians or somebody else. You have been positioned by God in a very unique position with the brilliance and the wisdom and the manpower and the ability that God has given you as a center of commerce, you have built a great nation like Antioch in the time of old. But Singapore, by your presence here, ladies and gentlemen, also represents the third center of influence, the church. You are alive. You as a nation and a country that are seeking God. And your presence here tonight, ladies and gentlemen, proof by point. Singaporeans are seeking God by the thousands and the tens of thousands. 
You are a city where Jerusalem, Antioch, and Rome is represented in one place. Where the three center of influence can work together and rise for the purpose of the kingdom in our time. Throw up that picture up again. Because ladies and gentlemen, we and you are the grand finale generation. And I believe there are many countries and many places that have the place in the kingdom of God to play and their mission to fulfill. But I'm totally convinced, ladies and gentlemen, that Singaporeans have a place in God's eternal purposes in these last days, and especially in this grand finale generation. I know that God positioned you in this place that seems to be a nation which is only a city, a city which is a great nation. And here in Singapore, all those three centers of influence collide and are here together that God intends to raise it and use it for the glory of God. I want to encourage you Singaporeans, keep on seeking God, keep on loving Jesus. Like the young man in this story in the book of Luke chapter 15, walk toward him and embrace him. And please, don't be really like the older son. The older son in the story, he never went away far. He always walked, worked for the father, went to church every Sunday whenever an opportunity arise. But when the father and the younger brother and the others begin to celebrate, he got his feelings hurt. He didn't want to come in. Papa has to walk out and talk with him. You see the problem with the young man, the older son I mean, though he never went far away, he lived in the father's house, but he doesn't have the father's heart for the loss. He lived in the father's palace, but he doesn't possess the father's passion for the nations and the loss in the nations. He lived in the father's castle, but he doesn't have the father's compassion for those who doesn't know him. He didn't go far away, but he was lost. The older brother, Jesus didn't finish the story, so we don't know whether he came back in or not and celebrate. But ladies and gentlemen, I believe for the city and the nation and the churches in Singapore to rise and fulfill their destiny in this grand finale generation. We need passion for the Lord and passion for the lost. Because I submit to you, ladies and gentlemen, that passion for the Lord and passion for the lost is the two sides of the same coin. In one side of the coin is passion for the Lord. The other side of the coin is passion for the Lord. And passion for the Lord and passion for the lost is the two sides of the same coin, which I believe is the only currency in the kingdom of God. Singaporeans, your time has come. You are a nation, you are a church that will rise in this grand finale generation to fulfill your destiny. I'm glad you're sending people to uh, Philippines, to East Timor. I want to thank you on their behalf. Somebody told me the City Mission Church had mission in 21 different countries, and I appreciate that very, very much. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm here to tell you that the great move, the Holy Spirit, that He's going to finish up the journey of the church in this generation, in this grand finale. You, the people in Singapore, the church in Singapore, and the nation of Singapore, and the business people in Singapore are going to play a great role in what God is doing in this time. I'm only here to encourage you to fulfill your destiny because God is going to do it. What He has done in my little island in Timor 48 years ago is just a precursor. It's just a little taste, great as it was, as to what He's going to do in these last days. What he's doing is in Mozambique is great, but that is just a little taste of what God is going to do in the coming days. Ladies and gentlemen, I came to City Mission Church this afternoon with a mission, looking for men and women who are willing to be possessed with the passion for the Lord and allow their heart to be filled with the passion for the lost, so that they can be the generation of Singaporeans that will rise and fulfill their destinies and make an impact in their generation for the life of millions in the nations. My question here this afternoon is, are you that one? Are you down with the one who are willing to be that person? If you are, ladies and gentlemen, then I challenge you to rise to your feet and I'm going to pray for you.